In a world of ever-changing economic landscapes, the unexpected often becomes the reality. But what happens when the second largest economy on the planet starts showing signs of rapid decline? Let's unveil a critical revelation, something that even the experts didn't see coming. The recent wave of commentary about the Chinese economy in the Western media reflects legitimate worries. Additionally, markets are not acting in a way that would suggest that the second largest economy in the world is close to experiencing a Lehman Brothers moment. The demand for iron ore from China, which is essential for their industrialization and which represents Australia's principal economic stake in the nation, is as high as ever. Iron ore prices have increased by 50% since their low point in October 2022, according to Louis Vincent Gave, the executive chief of the China-focused economic consultancy Gavical, who wrote about it in a column for the Financial Times. As time passed, the Western commentary about a Chinese slowdown has gotten louder. The current price of US $108 per ton contrasts to a low of US $40 during the most recent economic crisis in China, which occurred in late 2015. According to Gave, if a financial catastrophe were on the horizon, we could see its impact on bank shares, as was the case prior to the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and the subsequent European banking crisis a few years later. However, during the past year, Chinese bank shares have actually outperformed U.S. bank shares by 2.6%. He pointed out that Chinese government bond markets have outperformed U.S. Treasury bonds, the controversial sanctuary for anxious investors. Is this positive news for the Chinese economy? And could the public invest in those bonds to stay away from a possible crash? According to Adam Posen, the president for the Peterson Institute for International Economics, in the most recent edition for Foreign Affairs, China is undoubtedly experiencing challenges, but it's not yet clear that they sum up to the inevitable collapse of an economy governed by an authoritarian regime. He asserts that the issues facing China under the Xi Jinping are comparable to those facing Russia under Vladimir Putin, Venezuela under Nicolas Maduro, Turkey under the Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Hungary under Viktor Orban. Additionally, to add more problems, youth unemployment added fuel. As the unemployment rate for 16 to 24 years old in metropolitan areas rises in the post-COVID age, College students in China now face a frightening new reality, and hence their parents' significant expenditures in their education are less likely to transfer into respectable jobs after graduation. The most recent unemployment statistics, which showed a record of 21.3% for the age group in June, have drawn attention to this pattern. Behind this figure lie potentially millions of young Chinese people's altered live pathways, broken hopes, rising fears, and readjusted expectations. How are the youngsters in China going to pay the loans that they took for their college tuition? The situation is getting worse than you think. The nation's monthly economic activities report was scheduled to include the July youth unemployment numbers as well as other significant figures. Beijing doesn't want to leak the data to the public, citing methodological optimization, which increased public anxiety over data transparency and the nation's economic slump. According to Lu Feng, a professor at Peking University National School of Development, China is experiencing the most difficult period for youth unemployment since the reform and opening up in 1978. The large disparity between graduates and a struggling economy that has failed to generate enough vacancies in the labor market is one reason for the high rate of youth unemployment. China's graduating class in 2023 will reach a record high of about 11.6 million students, which is up more than 40% from the previous batch of graduates. The country's declining gross domestic product growth rate fell 3.76% during the same period, which stands in stark contrast to the growing number of graduates. Another contributing issue, according to Goldman Sachs Intelligence, is a mismatch between the skill sets college graduates acquire and the demands of companies or opening positions. The administration also noted that low-wage service professionals like housekeeping and blue-collar jobs like manufacturing, which recent graduates frequently avoid, are experiencing a severe labor shortage. Can we blame the industrial age during which our education system was framed? The housing market formerly the largest employer in the nation, which once benefited local governments by building up a reserve of household wealth, is currently in trouble. Small firms and employees that prospered during a long-lasting real estate bubble are no longer being compensated. The group, which includes painters, cement producers, and builders, 
as well as real estate agents and businesses that outfitted sales offices, is low on the priority list for developers in terms of payback, even though they are crucial to the housing ecosystem. Hence, suppliers are still awaiting payments for at least $390 billion, according to the research firm Gavical Research. Furthermore, that is only a cautious estimate. The actual number is certainly higher. People started to respond as they wanted their money. Hence, the number of lawsuits and complaints to the local government is rising. Additionally, at chained and locked construction sites that are idle, protest banners are being posted by construction workers. One poster reads, delaying wages is shameful. Another reads, country garden, repay my hard earned money. Have you heard of shadow banking in China? Is that an organization that lends money, illegally working without the knowledge of the government? A new analysis cast doubt on Beijing's capacity to interfere with physical stimulus as a rising crisis in the country's shadow banking industry threatens more harm to an economy already suffering from a number of issues. Shadow banking describes a portion of the Chinese economy that invests money outside of the controversial pipeline of bank-based lending in a variety of different investments across several economic sectors. These businesses don't operate in the shadows. They are big and well-known in China. Trust companies have for years provided Chinese investors with significantly higher returns on their savings than bank deposits in the nation. In a nation where the official interest rate on bank deposits is still less than 1.5%. When the Chinese economy was expanding at double-digit rates, it was very simple for trusts to deliver high rates of return, but in recent years, it has become considerably more challenging. The Chinese real estate market, which has recently gone through several crises, received a sizable share of funds invested through the trust sector. According to a recent analysis by Goldman Sachs, losses in the Chinese trust industry could total $38 billion. Finally, the Chinese economy is undergoing a deflation. In contrast to the major economies in the West, China's headline consumer price indicates experienced deflation for the first time in more than two years in July, declining 0.3% year over year. Although temporary variables like lower power and pork prices may have contributed to part of the headline weakness, dropping prices in the shelter and related categories as a result of the struggling real estate market has also had a negative impact on core inflation. Additionally, China has not experienced the same dynamics since ending its strict zero COVID measures because its domestic manufacturing power helped mitigate supply bottlenecks and global commodity prices moderated. Whereas Western economies emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic with elevated inflation amid constrained supply and resurgent demand, Chinese manufacturing goods continue to dominate consumer goods markets, particularly in the United States. Despite China's economy being rebalanced to be less dependent on its traditional pillars of real estate and exports of manufactured goods, according to U.S. Census Bureau data as of June, prices of goods imported from China are down 3% on average versus last year, while producers prices of consumer goods in China are down 5% in dollar terms. Will an economy be able to thrive on its own by producing all the goods in the country? The question is contrary, as it will bring nothing other than harm. Maximilian Ulier and Carolyn Robb of Deutsche Bank said in a research note, the central bank's rate cuts and the government's pledge of additional physical stimulus haven't done much to alleviate European investors' concerns about China's potential for recovery. They added that European businesses make around 10% of their revenues in China, making them strongly reliant on Chinese demand. Will the Chinese economy be able to recover despite all these problems? Anyway, let's hope for the better for the nation. Share your thoughts on which reason might have contributed much damage to China. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, so make sure to share them in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so so you don't miss out on our deep dive into the intricacies of global economic shifts. Stay informed and stay ahead.